Uh, 20,000 subscribers, cross the big 2-0 mark. Good afternoon everyone, welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski. Today we are going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at Eva Gonzalez and this painting, The Pink Slippers from uh, 1879, 1880, and um, I just think this is a beautiful painting. It's it's a little bit, um, it's, it's, probably, it's definitely not the most well-known painting of hers, uh, but many of her other paintings are larger and more complex, and as soon as I saw this painting when I was putting together research um, to, uh, for, to, so that we could study from her, I just was like, we've, we have never done a painting like this before. So I thought like, wow, this would be perfect. And it's also just a beautiful painting. I just think it's really cool. It's a really beautiful pair of shoes. So um, I'm really excited to do today's painting. And I'm also really excited to talk about today's artist because I think they're one of the, the great impressionist painters of all time. It just so happens to be a woman. And had she lived a little bit longer, I'm sure she would be way more well known than, than she is currently today. So if you're watching today's episode for the first time, maybe after it was recorded, you can jump to the timestamps in the playlist down below and go to the place you want to go. You can go right to the very end and check out how it turned out. And if you want to follow along and jump right back to the beginning, then you're welcome to do so. Um, and if so, welcome back. Uh, so there, our plan today is we're going to get the image on the canvas. We're going to stain it with a little bit of color. We're going to talk about Ava Gonzalez's biography. Uh, we're going to do a little, are we going to do an underpainting today? Maybe, maybe not. Then we're, we're going to work on the background, the foreground, background, foreground, and I always hesitate to give any estimation. I'd like to say two and a half hours, um, maybe closer to three. It, I think this painting is, it's simple and yet is just requires a little bit of patience is what I would say. So even a beginner painter should be able to to do a version of today's painting. So of course, like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. Um, I would love it if you commented on previous videos. Go back to some of the videos that you enjoyed the most. Leave a comment saying, this was my favorite one. This is my first one that I, that I saw and this is how I got hooked on these episodes that would be great that helps get more and more people watching these episodes and that gives me more and more encouragement to do more of them so um as well as if you want to leave a small donation there's paypal you can leave little as 25 cents as some people have done a dollar you can use the youtube super chat function although youtube takes like 30 40 percent of however much you give so the if you want me to get the most of your donation, then probably your best bet is uh, e-transfer, and you can use um, your my email, which is on my website. That links below, or you can send a check or e-transfer. Also, contact me through the Facebook group. Which, if you've never heard of the Facebook group, again, and you're new, join the Facebook group. We're almost at we're at 753 people, climbing day by day. Um, a great place for support if you're an artist who's just beginning and you, I encourage you to take a photograph of the painting you make today, whether it's Ava Gonzalez's pink slippers or anything else, upload it and then you get some feedback from other people in the group. And then usually once a month, I go through there and um, give some free feedback. I organize everything and I know I'm behind on that. Just been, been very busy lately here. Um, Anyway, let's uh, let's get to our first step here. So let's we're gonna do the image transfer first. Now we could sketch this out. This is not the most complex composition um, that we've done. We've done some very complex ones, and it takes twenty minutes to do the image transfer. So we could draw this out, or you could use the Dropbox link in the description below. So. You'll see that there's a link to a Dropbox folder, and within that folder at the very top are the resources for our first episodes, like the color wheel and um, painting supply guide, all that stuff. And then the next series here that are begin with letters, these are all our, our more simpler paintings. Some of them are a little bit more complex, perhaps. 
And then there's another 200 or so folders of, of more complicated paintings here. So we're going to go to Z18, Eva Gonzalez. And here we are, three files here. And those three files correspond to the original image. And then there's two versions of the outline, a JPEG and a PDF, whichever is easier for you to print out on your home printer at home. And you've got something like this, just a simple little image. So let me show you how you get this onto the canvas. So the first thing I should mention here is I've got a nine by 12 sized canvas board. And I, you can see there's all this white. What is all that white? Well, it, it comes pre-gessoed, right? Gesso triple primed. I don't know if it's been triple gessoed, but um, what I do is when I get it out of the plastic, I also put another coat of gesso, acrylic white gesso on the surface. And then I let it dry and then I use some sandpaper and then just sand it down. And that gives me a nice, nice smooth surface. And it's always easier to paint on a smooth surface than it is a textured surface. I much rather prefer painting on a smoother surface. Not everybody does, and I use the example of it's the difference between um, painting, you know, painting on a textured surface is like buttering a waffle. Painting on a smooth surface is like buttering a pancake, right? Much easier to butter a pancake and you need a lot less butter than you do on that waffle. You know, if you, you're trying to, you know, butter a waffle, half of it gets trapped in that first little pocket there and you're just bloating up with butter, right? So, I'm going to take this outline and I'm going to put it roughly in the middle here. Okay. And now let's do our image transfer. So you can see I'm, I'm actually using graphite transfer paper. It's I know this says carbon transfer paper, but this is graphite transfer paper that I just put in this envelope. I ordered this off of Amazon, and I think you get like 50 sheets for $10 or something, and you can reuse that sheet over and over again. And you can see that this one's been used many times. You wanna put the shiny side facing down. There are some that come double-sided, in which case it doesn't matter which side's up or down, right? Okay. So, we'll draw this out, just quickly trace it. It's always interesting to me to hear people, you know, who get, um, who have very moral, ethical concerns about tracing an image onto a canvas. And... It doesn't surprise me um, that, that that's a thing, uh, but you may be comforted to know that artists have been using any kind of tracing device to speed up the transfer to, to, to get, or get more accuracy of their images. Michelangelo used cartoons, giant sheets of paper that had drawings on them to transfer those images onto the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. If you think that he was going to climb up and down that scaffold every time he needed to get another look at what he was painting, it w he would still be up there painting. All right, so don't be... Uh, don't listen to those negative voices. Artists will use whatever tool is available to get the job done. Just as your dentist is going to use an x-ray to help them identify which teeth might have cavities, right? You wouldn't want to go to a dentist who says, I use my intuition to uh, determine which tooth is uh, rotten. So uh, open up and I'm just gonna start pulling teeth the ones that I just have a feeling need to go. You'd probably be able to 
run faster than you've ever run from that dentist's office, if you heard that. Okay. But I get those comments all the time. People are, there, a lot of people have hang-ups over that, and that's okay. Um, okay. Actually, you know what? Just before I move on, I just want to show you just something that I've, I, I was just doing earlier today, which is... I just took a piece of scrap wood and I just and I measured it out. I drew and I drilled holes at a slight angle um, so that I could put and I and I got these from the dollar store, these wooden dowels. I'm just showing this now because I know I'll forget. And these can go in here. I'll put a few in. I'm debating whether to glue them in or just leave them like this so that I can take these paintings and as they dry they can just sort of sit in here or even after they're, they've dried um, so that the faces aren't touching one another so that the backs and faces aren't touching one another. All right, so obviously I can fit a whole bunch on here. I'll just show you another one that I also put together. Just a very similar kind of thing. This was also... Uh, I just found some other sizes of dowels. And these are, I think I got them also from a different dollar store. Also for a dollar. They're a little bit shorter. So I was going to experiment with whichever ones work best. I think I might not put glue in here. I think they're going to be fine without the glue. But again, just like that, right? So this way, because I've got a lot of <laughs> way too many paintings scattered all over here. I have to photograph them and I have sleeves and everything. I put them in, but I've just been too busy to even do that. So maybe you're in the same position because you really don't want to be just stacking these all up and just sitting them on a shelf because you might find a few weeks later when you go to show them to your friends that oh no they're stuck together uh, and then you peel them apart and then part of the f the painting pulls off onto the back of another painting <gasps> oh my goodness that feeling is the worst so anyway i just wanted to share that <laughs> with you all. There we go. We're going to put that out of the way. And you know, maybe just while I'm blabbing on here, I should also just mention, well, you know what, let's come, I'll come back to that when we talk about uh, her biography. Okay, so uh, let's, um, uh, Kathy says, wow, great idea. Looks like barbecue skewers would work. I was also thinking maybe chopsticks could work. All you need is just a piece of wood and then just drill some quick holes inside. I may even make a video just showing how to do something similar. I went to Home Depot and I was looking at um, buying wood dowels for this. And, you know, they were basically like $1.50 a foot. And I was thinking, a foot? I mean, that's going to cost me like $100 to make one of those boards because there's going to be what 15 15 feet on one side 50 or there's 20 so that's 40 40 feet right so yeah it's about like 60 bucks just for the the dowels on a cheap thing like that right so chopsticks you know barbecue skewers barbecue skewers might be a little bit too thin I'm, i would be a little bit afraid of of them kind of just snapping and then a domino effect cascading down. Anyway, let's uh, get going here. Okay, our next step here is to stain the canvas with a little bit of color. And so we're going to use what the Italians called the imprematura. Say it with me, the imprematura. Right, and it literally means the priming layer or the first layer of paint. And um, you don't have to do this. Um, not every artist did, and and the impressionists were really the first artists that that stopped doing it or did it less than other artists had done previous to that. 
And there's, I would say probably the majority of other teachers on YouTube don't show you how to do this. Um, but I'm a big believer in this technique. I think especially if you're a beginner painter, it just makes your paintings look a little bit more professional. Now, I'm about to use this particular paint, and if you're wondering what it is, um, uh, well, the, the paint I'm about to, about to use here is this Azo Yellow Deep. And uh, you'll see that I've got two yellows, two reds, two blues, a white, and I have a black, but I rarely use it. And I've got it in here, but this is, I've probably had the same tube of black paint since we began almost three years ago. And it's barely, you know, it's maybe half full. Because we can mix our own black here by using warm red, warm or cool blue, and cool yellow. Right? And of course, I'll be talking about that very shortly because we're going to be doing a lot of black in this painting. Um, but we call, we call this a split primary palette. And this is the colors that I'm using here. Not sponsored, not paid by anybody. No one gave me any free supplies. I went and bought it just like everybody else. A tube of paint like this costs summer routine maybe $12, $15. This is for the 250 milliliter um, bottle. Now you could go get the Amster, or sorry, the uh, golden paint here. This probably costs, I would have to check, but somewhere either around $25 to $40 uh, for this tube of paint. And you can see it's much smaller. This, how many milliliters is in here? 148, right? So it's it's almost half, a little bit over half the amount of paint in here for maybe three times the price. And I was just having a conversation with someone on their Facebook group about this, um, that uh, essentially, is there a difference between more expensive paint and cheaper paint? Of course there is, of course there is. But for our purpose, most people are not gonna notice the difference at all. In fact, you know, I made the comparison of um, the difference between you know, your organic banana and your regular banana. Is there a difference? Of course there's a difference. Can you taste the difference? Some people swear they can. Um, but, you know, is it worth paying twice the amount of price for? You know, maybe ethically, I suppose, perhaps. But is it, is there a, um, a benefit in terms of your smoothie? Does it taste better? I don't know. I, I mean, I'm sure I, I'm, that comparison might not be the best comparison because I'm sure some people right now are steam coming out of their heads about organic food. I'm a vegetarian. I love vegetables. I, I you know, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't even, okay. So anyway, I just showed a whole bunch of different paints that I recommend. This one I don't recommend because it has um, a, a lot of white, titanium white mi um, mixed into the mixture here. Now someone did send me an email saying that these Amsterdam paints also have white in them as well. And that's true. Probably the majority of less expensive paints do have a little bit of white in them to thicken up the paint um, or to make it a little bit more opaque because that is certainly one difference between more expensive paints and cheaper paints is that you have a higher amount of raw pigment in a more expensive paint than a cheaper paint. And in order to make it still work, they add a little bit of white in there. So it's more likely that you'll get an actual pure black if you use the golden paints or even the Amsterdam um, Expert Elite Series or whatever they call it. Uh, so, um, but you know, for our purpose, we've done what 200, this is the 271st painting. And some of those episodes, I did five or six paintings in the same episode. So we're well over 300 paintings. And, you know, I think it works just fine. And I'm using it for my own graphic novel that I'm painting at the moment. So I have no complaints. Okay, so let me uh, just start putting some, I'm going to put all my paint on the palette here real quick. Um, and then I'm going to stain the canvas. Now I'm just thinking to myself, am I going to need all these colors? I don't know if I'm going to need the red. 
the cool red, as I often don't. Yeah, well, let's put a bit of it on here. I keep forgetting my little device to squeeze out the remnants of this. We're also going to need some white. So I'm going to take this yellow. Put about maybe 30 to 40 percent water to 60 percent paint in here. This um, Adding a little bit of water just helps it stain the surface and dry just a little bit faster so that I can move a little faster. Uh, this is the only time I ever use water when I'm painting with acrylic paint. Uh, and that would also be what the manufacturer would recommend that you do, that you don't use water when you're painting. I would say the ma vast majority of people do. I'm sure probably even some people who've been painting with me for years now do, but that's okay. I mean, there's there's no paint police that are coming going to come and take you away. It's just, you know, not not particularly encouraged or recommended. And I think there's better alternatives than water to use, such as mediums. And we're going to use a few mediums today. And they're not that much more. You know, it's obviously it's costs more than water. Um, but. Uh, you know, if you're going to be doing lots of painting, you probably want to strongly think about getting some of them anyway. Uh, mediums, that is, to help you with your painting process. Beautiful. Okay. And then I like just to wipe off that excess paint. <laughs> Kathy says I really like his food analogies. You could you you can tell that I like to eat, right? <laughs> Even though I know absolutely nothing about food. And, you know, it's one of, I mean, in terms of, like, um, cooking food, you know, it's, you know, I've taken cooking classes, and then they'll, like, say, taste it. Does it need more salt or sugar or whatever? And I'm like, I have no idea. Like, I have no idea. It tastes good. Right? So, I, my palate, in that sense, is, is super underdeveloped. Um, but I know it's something that if I was really interested, I could learn how to identify the, the, the differences. And that's and I, I say that because it's similar to like learning how to identify colors and to mix colors. Because that is a difficult thing to do and it takes time and practice and you, and you have to put that energy in to be able to learn that skill of which I've done over the past 20 years. So... Um, if you're if you you get frustrated because you, you you're like I have no idea why he's picks that color, well it's it takes some practice, but the easiest thing to do is always just remember where is it in a painting, where is that color? Is it in the foreground or the background? If it's in the background, you got three cool colors to choose from: cool yellow, cool blue, cool red. <laughs> and if it's in the foreground, then you know it's going to be either a warm red, warm yellow, or warm blue in combinations thereof. There are times where we might put a little bit of cool color in the foreground or background, but for the most part, that's a really good, um, 
I wouldn't say a rule, but a guideline that you would probably want to consider. I, the vast majority of artists throughout art history have used those principles to make their paintings. Okay. So let's move on here, and while the imprimatura slowly dries, let's talk about the biography of today's artist. It's gonna drive me crazy. One second, I've got my pad is all wet. Okay, there we go. Okay, so Eva Gonzalez is born in 1849 and dies in 1883 at the age of 34 years old, and. What a shame that she died so young, because as we'll see, she did a lot of great work at a, you know, at a pretty great pace. And had she had another decade or two, at least, to, to, to work, we, she would be on the tip of most people's tongues, especially today. As, as we're looking, you know, as, as more and more we look back in time at the great female artists who were overlooked um, or suppressed for various different reasons, um, I think she would be way, way, way more, more well-known. But unfortunately, as we'll find out, she died way too young. Um, so uh, Eva Gonzalez is one of the, the great Impressionist painters who also happened to be female. And so she's along with other great Impressionists, or uh, female Impressionists would be Mary Cassatt, Berta Morisot, and Mary Brockmond. And I just wanted, since I've got... Um, Here's here's our uh, Berta Moriso painting that we did. Here, maybe I'll just show these here. And I also just since we just did the imprimatura, I always I like to show these side by side because this has got the yellow imprimatura and this has got the more traditional brown imprimatura. They you can of course tell the difference when they're side by side like that. Um, but if they're on the other side of the room from one another, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. Right, so. Um, obviously you can mix a brown in Prematur and put it down first. Um, and really, it's only really that obvious because, you know, I've kind of made, deliberately made this layer of paint quite thin for this Berta Morisot painting. Um, anyway, there's, um, uh, Berta Morisot. There's our Mary Cassatt painting. Um, the, she was an American artist who moved to France, and we, we did this painting by her um, a few months ago. I love this painting. You could just see how expressive that is. And then here's our Marie Brockmond painting that we did. So um, these, these three artists I just mentioned, Marie Brockmond, Marie Cassatt, and Berta Morisot, um, the difference between them and today's artist, Eva Gonzalez, is that these three women also exhibited alongside the men um, as part of the Impressionist exhibitions that were held between 1876, uh, no, 1874 and 1886. So there were eight um, official Impressionist exhibitions in Paris during that time. And Eva Gonzalez did not participate in any of them. And why is that? Well, as we'll learn here, one of her uh, mentors, her, her really most important teacher, was Edouard Manet, who is seen today as really the, one of the most important Impressionist painters of all time, who also never exhibited with the Impressionists as part of their official exhibitions. So I'm not exactly sure why Eva Gonzalez did not, but but uh, Edouard Manet did, uh, did not, and um, really he didn't because he, I think, was afraid of how uh, that might impact his sales because he was still exhibiting as part of the salon. And maybe I've gone a little bit too far, so let's kind of loop back here. So um, Eva Gonzalez, you know, she's born in Paris. Her, uh, her father is a, a well-known playwright and novelist, Emmanuel Gonzalez, and uh, he's, um, he's, he's really, you know, a highly esteemed personality. He becomes the president of the Société, Société, Société des Gens des Lettres, 
um, which, you know, is like the the Arts and Letters Club, of which they, members of the Group of Seven, belong to in Toronto, uh, that we've talked a lot about. So it's one of those kind of, um, not a union, but it's like a, another way of thinking, it might be like the Royal College of Art, uh, or Royal, no, how do they call it in Canada, the Royal, Royal Academy of Canadian Artists, or RCA? Right? Yeah, something like that. Um, it, it's one of these sort of groups that is that was formed that is kind of helps lend legitimacy to different artists and give them a um, help facilitate sales and you know it's like a stamp of approval just like we were talking about organic bananas right it's sort of um, so anyway uh, her father was the president of that group, and he was also a well-known author that, that such famous artist as Emile Zola, um, who was a, a really important French author in his own right, um, uh, was a huge fan of, of him growing up. So the fact that her father was this like preeminent figure within the elite art circles of Paris at the time was gave her a huge advantage and when she was young and started to show interest in in making art her father was very proud and encouraged her which was unusual at the time there were certainly lots of other um, male artists and writers who had daughters who did not encourage them at all or who sort of might have encourage them a little bit but ultimately we're like yeah it's just you should probably just get married and, and to an artist and then just you could just watch him paint that's probably acceptable right <laughs> um anyway so because of of his connections she took classes with the, with charles chaplin not to be confused with charlie chaplin although what's funny is that later on um Paintings by Charles Joshua Chaplin were selling at auction, and people confused him with the actor Charlie Chaplin, who played the tramp in, in movies like Modern Times and The Great Dictator and um, The Gold Rush, all of which are amazing movies. If you've never seen a Charlie Chaplin film, my goodness, um, still hold up to this day 100 plus years later. Anyway, it is funny that, that people were confused thinking they were buying paintings by the actor Charlie Chaplin. They're like, wow, he makes pretty good paintings. When it turns out, no relationship whatsoever. But Charles Joshua Chaplin was a, uh, a notable figure painter, society portrait painter of his time. And so you could see like these, he had a, a facility for painting recognizable, um, uh, you know, capturing likenesses very quickly. In a the style that that you know it's not impressionism, but it's it's on its way towards impressionism, where we start seeing a looser and looser, as we call more, quote unquote, painterly uh, touch, where in painterly just sort of means we can literally see the paint brushes, right? The artist is is less interested in trying to hide those paint brushes and create the illusion that we're not looking at a painting, but we're looking through a window at somebody. Right, so these paintings by Chaplin show like this kind of a efficiency and speed, like especially right here. I mean, this is really starting to to verge towards um, Edouard Manet's paintings, who we'll see here shortly. Anyway, just um, so she starts taking classes with Chaplin, and um, starts really showing some some early promise. And because of that, again, her father says like wow, we better, like, this, I think this is your calling. I think you're really a real artist. You're a really good artist. So he uh, introduces her to Edouard Manet, and Edouard Manet was the, uh, he was a really well-known artist at the time, but also in a period of kind of great struggle, um, because he was trying to go the, 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 he, he was trying to to follow the system as it existed at the time, which was to submit paintings every fall and spring to the Salon. And the Salon, we've talked about this hundreds of times, but just as a quick review, 
back in the mid 1800s and for about 200 years before that if you were an artist and you wanted to sell or exhibit your paintings you had to to submit your paintings to the salon and then about like 10 old white guys with beards would sit around in a room and select their favorite paintings and if you were selected by those artists your art would be on display in these big like gymnasium sized uh, halls and that would give you like a stamp of approval that you were that you were good enough to be exhibited alongside all these other painters including the guys who chose your work of course they would put their own work in there um, but if you were rejected by them then you were kind of screwed like your options for selling your work were were I mean unless you found somebody outside of that circle who is willing to support you you're you'd likely not sell that work so it was uh, a bit of a you know it was a racket and these gatekeepers were preventing people from um, uh, because you know if, especially if you were a wealthy person who was buying art the idea of you buying art from an artist that wasn't officially approved by the salon would be I suppose if you were an iconoclast you'd say hey I got this artwork this guy he submitted to the salon and they didn't they they wouldn't accept it you know like I'm super dangerous I'm sure maybe there was a few people like that but for the most part people would be like why would you that the stuff this was rejected by the salon like the salon is the is you know is the stamp of approval and that seems crazy that you would buy an artwork that wasn't appro officially approved. So Edouard Manet is submitting, and he's getting some works in, including some of these ones we're seeing here, which were at the time quite controversial, because they, they're starting to look weirder and weirder and more and more different than the paintings that were um, generally on display, which, you know, most of that work looked very similar for about 200 years. It was, you know, this, you know, post renaissance kind of rococo baroque kind of work and you know it's it was very academic um and kind of you know there was some there's certainly lots of beautiful work produced in that time but it all kind of starts to look the same to be quite frank and they're all using very similar kind of methodology and approach so the Edouard Manet, you could see, is starting to get looser and looser with his brushstrokes. I mean, you could see a painting like this. It's just like, wow, that's this is the kind of thing that, that his peers would have said, like, this is the start of a painting. This is or it's a sketch. This is certainly not something you would exhibit. I mean, my goodness, keep this stuff to yourself, Edouard. So and that's the, the period of time where Edouard Manet is introduced to the young Eva Gonzalez. She's 20 years old. And I'm sure Edward was like, uh, sure, Emmanuel, um, I'll, uh, let me, let me meet your daughter. Okay, sure, I'll do you a favor. I'm sure he was probably thinking, well, this guy is like a really powerful guy in the, in the local Parisian, you know, scene. It would benefit me if I just at least looked at his daughter's portfolio and humored her a little bit. But then they meet and he's like, wow. She's actually pretty good. She's a pretty good artist. So much so that she becomes the only student that Edouard Manet actually ever had over the course of his life, which is saying something. Edouard Manet was, you know, a fairly, um, uh, what would you say? Re not, well, maybe a little bit reclusive, but just kept to himself and didn't really engage. You know, a lot of, there were lots of other, like, being an art teacher as it is still today is a, is a way that artists support themselves and Edouard Manet was sort of doing okay not as well as he wanted so there wasn't really any incentive for him to take on students as many ar other artists did so the fact that he accepts Eva Gonzalez as one of his students I says I think is like is pretty remarkable not only that he also starts um, making paintings of her so she starts she also has a sort of double life as a model for other artists and of course i'll never find it okay so here's uh, this is um a painting that this is in the national gallery of uh in if england in london england and this is a painting by Edward Manet of Eva Gonzalez making a painting. 
And actually this painting was exhibited in the salon and in that same exhibition, Eva Gonzalez also had a couple of paintings that were also accepted. And that's a big deal, again, for a young woman who's at this time about 24 years old, to have a painting um, included in the salon is like, you know, very rare. We're talking at a time where maybe, you know, once every two or three years, one painting by a woman is included in that exhibition of which there's maybe 200 other men in there, right? So Eva Gonzalez, young age, her work is accepted in the salon, and alongside that, there's a portrait of her by Manet in the exhibition, which um, you would think is not that big of a deal. Unfortunately, however, um, what kind the unfortunate side effect of this is that this artwork really overshadows her own artwork in that um, people start to look at her really as just a model who kind of dabbles in painting and that no matter how good her paintings actually are it's just like well she's just a pretty girl she's a pretty girl that does a few paintings they're okay but man she is beautiful right and part of it is the fact that in this painting, Edouard has her dressed up in this beautiful gown. You know, there's no paint on it whatsoever, so it also sort of looks like she might just be posing with somebody else's painting. And so much so that people even start doubting the authenticity of Ava Gonzalez's own artwork, and there's rumors that maybe Edouard Manet painted all of her paintings, or that maybe he started them, or finished them, or... You know, because surely she was not talented enough to do them on her own. She's just this pretty girl, right? Like, come, give me a break. Um, so, unfortunately, that kind of... All of those prejudices uh, kind of follow her around throughout uh, the course of her, her, her short career. Um, she is... Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's just take a quick look at some of her paintings here. Um, I do think it's interesting, again, if you look up her, her name, it goes to the wiki art page, and what do we see at the top of a page about her? We see Edouard Manet's painting of her, right? There are a few photographs of her out there, I think it's just, it's, it's telling that a hundred plus years, 150 years later after she's died, this painting by Edouard Manet still is the first thing we see when we look her up. And then we got to scroll down to find the actual paintings by her. Now, um, the paintings that she did do, you know, bear a striking resemblance to some of Edouard Manet's paintings. Edouard Manet, you know, when I first looked, I was like, gosh, that, I'm, that looks like an Edouard Manet painting. I mean, it's no surprise that she was his student, um, but he did do a number of paintings like this of kind of young boys, like, like drummer boys and trumpeters from the military, because of course, at that time you have the Franco-Prussian War, so there's, um, that's sort of on the top of everyone's mind if you're in France at the time. Um... So you, another thing that, that we see here, which is also very common for a lot of uh, women artists of the time, is that most of the paintings that women are making are, are almost entirely domestic scenes of, you know, other women, their friends and sisters, you know, inside the house, you know, in this case, sleeping, playing piano, knitting, sewing, spending time with their children, playing with their children, flowers, you know, so because you know, the, on the, the women were just not allowed to to do all the things that men were allowed to do, and literally at art school, you know, the the highest peak of what an artist is um, it can do is to make history paintings, big genre paintings of like battle scenes of heroic Napoleon on his horse kind of thing, right? And of course, only men are allowed to do those paintings, and then you have kind of below that a number of different tiers and of course at the very bottom you have you know these domestic scenes and you have like still lives of flowers and then you have little children and all these different things then you get up to landscapes and so on so so 
you know, women were allowed to, to, you know, work in this little area here, never to, of course, go into this area, because, let's face it, I'm sure that there was that anxiety amongst men at the time, is like, what would happen, I mean, they, I'm, unconsciously, I'm sure they're thinking, like, what would happen if we let women paint a history painting and they did a better job than the men would do? Oh my goodness, that would just throw all of our stereotypes out of whack and how would we explain why we keep women down? That just wouldn't make it... So then we'd have to totally change our thinking about everything else. In the way. So of course women aren't allowed to participate in that... Um, in, in in that type of uh, in those genres of painting <coughs> excuse me nevertheless she does all these really fantastic paintings I just want to show here's another painting in the Metropolitan Museum collection um, of course most of these works are not on display anywhere you know I think it says somewhere in here like not on view you look up all of her work not on view not on view it's sitting in storage somewhere so all, even to this day, all these great female artists uh, out there, most of them, whatever work they created is um, often just sitting in storage somewhere. And although I will show you here, there was a great, this is a, a I, I think I returned it. Um, so anyway, there was a great book I got from the library uh, called Women Artists in Paris, 1850 to 1900, which is an exhibition that traveled uh, around the east coast of the United States a few years ago. Um, and a really great show. That, that's how I found today's painting, because it didn't originally pop up when I was doing searches for Eva Gonzalez before. But um, a great book that's got a whole bunch of other great women artists of the time, many of whom uh, I have had never heard of myself, who are just like, whoa, how is, you're like, you're flipping, like, how is this person not, like, the most famous artist in the world, <laughs> right? And it's, you know, there's lots of reasons for that, mostly because it's a lot easier to just to keep repeating the same ten guys over and over and over again, right? Um, uh, okay, so let's, let's just kind of quickly wrap up here. What else do I want to say? Um, so she gets married, um, in 1879 to the engraver for Manet's painting. So what would happen back in the day before we had color photography is if you wanted your art reproduced anywhere, if you wanted it to be reproduced in the newspaper, what you would need to do is you would have to hire an artist or you could do it yourself you'd hire an artist to do a reproduction of your painting as a print and so they would do an etching which is like a, a plate of metal and then you scrape into it and you do as faithful of an image as possible and then that can substitute for your painting because of you know um, of course, there's not color reproductions for for why. Uh, I mean, there were color reproductions, but often they're hand painted, right? Very time consuming process. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so Manet had hired this fellow Henri Girard to um, uh, to to do reproductions for him. He was making a lot of work, and so she marries him after a long engagement, and they have a, a son named Jean Raymond. Um, and sort of you know, like literally hours after this young boy is born, um, she gets the news that Edouard Manet has died. And um, kind of in a, in a twisted bit of fate, she also passes away just a few days later um, af of complications from the birth of her son. So it is sort of like what a... a, a you know, a terrible coincidence that she passes away, you know, within days of her mentor, who was much, much older than her. And so she dies at age 34. And um, her sister ends up um, helping her husband raise her son. Eventually, her sister and her, her widowed husband um, marry and uh, raise their son together. But, um, yeah, it's just like, it's, uh, oh, in fact, another thing too is just as, just to kind of wrap up, 
to kind of go back to Manet, or uh, yeah, Manet, that you know there was a, a retrospective exhibition of hers in 1885, and once again, um, the portraits of her by other artists, including Manet, overshadowed her own artwork. That's all anybody wanted to talk about is is how beautiful she was and not her own paintings. And so it's it's interesting that as time has sort of gone on and there's, you know, we can now kind of more, I think, clearly uh, appreciate her own artwork on its own merits instead of sort of the, the, the big shadow of this great artist who uh, was her teacher. Because you just, I mean, I, I look at these paintings. Uh, I love this painting, the white shoes. This is another um, uh, another shoe painting. That I've seen this this painting exhibited alongside today's painting. I think today's painting is superior to this one, but it is just interesting that uh, again, um, there's another painting of shoes, and I, I also just, you know, it's it's worth just thinking that. Um, of if you're looking for something to paint there's there's no shame in painting a picture of, of something like your shoes van gogh did many paintings of his shoes he did paintings of the chair he sat on right so this idea that you have to have some kind of epic subject in, to paint is um is pretty silly if you think about it this also is is quite a, a famous painting of hers that um is also very reminiscent of, of Manet's painting of the bartender. What is that one called? That's a super famous painting. But um, this painting is, I think, of um, you know she's got these these uh, binoculars and she's like in a in the um, a booth at the opera, right? Which was also would have been you know, pushing the boundaries of what a woman would have been able to do, like painting a woman in this social environment like that w was um, was a bit of a, uh, you know, bit iconoclastic, a bit pushing the boundaries. Anyway, fascinating artist. I think it's time to turn our attention to painting this painting by this great artist. So maybe just quickly before I do that, I see that mine's still a little bit wet, so I'm going to hit it with the blow. Oops, no, we want to do our background. Okay, so what we want to do next is we want to start painting our background in. And um, we're, we're going to spend a little bit of time doing this because it's important to kind of get the, the background right because um, there's not, I mean, there's the shoes and the background and that's kind of it. And Sometimes having a really simple background is deceptively difficult because it's, you know, um, uh, without it, the, 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 the image in the center isn't properly supported. So let's take a look at how she did this, I, which I think is like an exceptional um, job of this reflective surface that these shoes are sitting on here. So let's sort of use our x-ray vision and see if we can zoom in here. You can see this is the, the scan from that book uh, that I was mentioning before. As you can see, there's the, the bende dot pattern in here. Um, it does make it hard to see, but I think it looks like she's painted maybe a brown, and that could just be the brown imprematura underneath what I'm looking for I'm trying to use like my x-ray vision to see 
if I can see in between any gaps, maybe the texture of the canvas to see what colors are here. So, you know, if I zoom out a little bit more, I can see it's a little bit lighter on this side. So I think that's like a cool brown that she's got going on there. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to mix up a, a cool brown and... So, oops, I am indeed actually going to use a little bit of this um, warm uh, or cool red, actually. So, let's mix this over here. So we're taking our cool brown and our cool yellow and some cool blue. And this gives us a cool brown. Now, of course, we could, if you wanted to do this much faster, we could just easily paint the background black and we'd be done in five minutes, right? But I, I'm interested in trying to really see how one of these great artists put together this painting, right? It's, you know, layering of paint like this is something artists have been doing for a long time, but it's also just gives the painting that extra little, you know, um, uh, that thing that you can't put your finger on. You're just like, what is it about this painting? So I'm actually just gonna add oops, a little bit of uh, matte medium here. Oh, not that much. But, uh, <clears throat> okay. So matte medium, this is like, instead of adding water to the paint, I'm adding matte medium. And it's just gonna thin it out ever so much. So a little bit of that yellow that I put down as my imprimatur is going to come through a little bit. It also is going to make it not appear quite so dark. Which might sound funny because we're like, we're going to paint it black over top. Why are you so concerned about not making it dark? Well, I don't want the whole thing to be pitch black. In her painting, there's still that little bit of lightness that I think is what makes it so fantastic. Now, I'm not concerned about painting over the edges. I just want to try to avoid texture there. Now it's possible that that she might have just incorporated this into her imprimatura, or that this color would be her imprimatura layer. So as opposed to painting that yellow like I did, which is probably nobody else on earth does. Um, and certainly she wouldn't have. Okay, so I gotta kind of wrap this up 
pretty quickly because it's starting to dry and it's starting to get a little bit tacky. And as it gets tacky like this, I end up, rather than painting, I start to kind of pull paint off that surface. So I think I gotta... Just don't like that ridge that was there. Now, I'm not sure what that looks like on camera. This does look a little orangey. It's definitely more brown. Uh, kind of looks like a dried scab or something. So this looks a little bit more orangey on camera than it, than it is in person, but I'm actually really happy with the way that turned out, so. He says, does anybody know when our next feedback will be, please? Uh, I don't know myself when it will be. Um, I'm uh, really behind in a lot of different things, and it takes me a while to put those episodes together, So I'm, and there's a lot of work coming in, so it's, um, it gets bigger and bigger of a task every day. Uh, um... So, I'd like to say, yeah, I don't, I don't, I hesitate to even say, I'm not sure, but I'm trying to find it on the schedule. Might be, maybe not this Sunday, but the Sunday after, if I can make it work. Devoxian says, hello teacher, how are you doing today? I am doing great, thank you. <laughs> well, he says, oh, lovely, a dry scab. Mmm. <laughs> uh, okay. So. Um, you know what? I'm just going to experiment with this. Before, I was just about to blow dry it, and I thought, you know what? Maybe let's just take a rag, and I'm just gonna bring the these side by side up. I probably should have done this while it was still wet, but what if we just kind of wipe a bit of the reflection away? Because this is going to be black, you know, it's this reflection on a black table, so it's okay for it to be a little bit more muted. Okay, so I have to be careful because now I'm starting to wipe away some of the, the yellow as well. So I'm getting down to the white. So that's not bad. Okay. That's cool. I like that. I like how that, that looks and feels at this particular moment in time. So, uh, let me, I'm going to blow dry this. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll put some black over top of this.
So, let's look next. So we want to mix a black that we're going to put over top of all of this. And so my, um, my thinking at the moment is just like, which step should I go to next? Should I paint the shoes and then the black? Or should I do the black and then the shoes? And the answer might be a little bit of both. Um, the reason why I would, I would probably want to paint the black first is I paint the black first, I can try to get a fairly even application of paint so that I don't have too many streaks of paint. I can kind of fearlessly go over top of these edges of the shoes and then if I'm later on, I can go back and paint and clean that up so that um, I don't, because you see right now how the way this is painted, you know, there's a little bit of that line and it doesn't look you know, it, it looks, you know, a little bit messy. Not that there's anything wrong with that, if that's the look you're going for, but that's not what we see in her painting. She's done a fairly kind of clean, it's very carefully done. Now, it is easier to paint, to do what she's done with, and to do it in oils, which is what she did, than it is with acrylic, because you could easily paint the whole thing with, with oil paint and even cover some of the the shoes right we could take our paintbrush and just cover that and then just take a rag and then just wipe that um, wet oil paint off because the wet oil paint is going to stay wet for weeks right with acrylic paint you know once it starts to dry you're kind of you're it's kind of there right so it's easier to to put that black over and then we could put some white on those edges and clean those edges up if we needed to um, so I think that's what I'm going to do. The only reason why I might paint the shoes... Is there a reason I'd want to paint the shoes first? Um, not really. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what would justify that, but I can't think of it off the top of my head. So now let's mix our black paint. Um, so to mix a black, what we're going to do... Uh, is to add, and I'll just kind of go back to this uh, here so that you can see. We're going to use 33% warm red, 33% cool blue, 33% cool yellow, right? And so I just want to take a quick uh, detour here just to talk about why that is. So what we're talking about is mixing basically the green, taking our cool yellow and our cool blue, and that gives us our green, right? And that gives us a really nice saturated green. What's the opposite of green on the color wheel? Red. And more specifically, the warm red. The cool, if we add cool red to this mixture, we're more likely to get our cool brown, which we just got, right? Whereas if we use the warm red, it's just a little bit further away and it's, it's a warmer color, so it has literally the opposite kind of pigments. So when they crisscross through the center, they neutralize one another and turn into black, All right? So cool yellow, cool blue, warm red, equal amounts of each get black. And the reason why this is gray inside is if we add a little bit of white to it, it turns gray. Okay. There's our little art history, or not art history, our art uh, technique lesson, technical lesson. Um, let's do this here. And we may want to make a little bit more paint than we might necessarily need um, so that we can keep our black consistent because it is hard to mix a black. It's not the easiest thing to do, but we'll talk about um, why that is here in a moment. So now, so I've taken my cool yellow, my cool blue, and I'm adding my warm red to it. And at first, maybe it's a little bit brown, and we just keep mixing it together. And slowly, as those colors mix in, they start to neutralize one another. So 
So that's pretty good. It still looks a little bit more on the brown side of things. And why does it look more brown and not quite black? And what color do we need to add to make it a little bit more black? Well, brown is close. It has means there's more yellow and red in it, right? If this looked, so that means we need more blue. If it looked a little bit more purple, that would mean we've got a lot of red and blue, but we need more yellow. And if it was a little bit more green, then means we've got a lot of yellow and blue and we need more red. So it's just, what is the opposite? What, you know, what color is it? And what is the opposite color? That's the color we need more of. I think that's pretty close, but let's just add a little bit more blue here. There we go. Now, as I said, this isn't a perfect solid black. Um, and that's because there's a little bit of that white uh, titanium white pigment filler in this paint, which is a little bit of a cheaper paint. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit more of my matte medium. And this is just going to thin it out a little bit. And also when I paint over parts of the brown, it's not going to go totally black. It's going to be slightly, just a little bit transparent which means I can do a second layer on the left side of the painting to darken it even more. So here, I thought I wasn't gonna, I thought I used up all that, put too much matte medium on here and then it turns out I needed it after all. And I just wanna make sure it's nice and thoroughly mixed so that I don't have one blob of paint which has got Lots of matte medium and one blob of paint that has none in there, right? Okay. So. That's great. It's nice and just a little bit thin. Perfect. how this looks just like this but I think we'll we'll do it just the way she did um, Just did that because there was kind of a darker ridge of paint right here. So I want to, I don't want that to build up in that particular area. I don't mind if it's elsewhere, but not right there. Okay, I'm gonna use my rag again to bring back the. Reflection here, where was it?
Okay, that's cool. Again, another thing that's important to know is that it does look darker in person. I have the, the brightness bumped up on my camera just so you can see what happens in some of the darker areas of the painting. So it's not quite as maybe light as it might appear on camera, but that's okay. I want to do another layer. Mm, probably maybe over the whole thing. I'm just trying to think, do I want to do it over here? I think what I need to do is just blow dry it and then let's just see. Because as it dries, it might look a little bit darker or lighter. You never really know. Okay, let's do that again. Um, it might be just worth just sort of trying on this maybe darker side here, how effective, how dark it actually gets. That's pretty dark. Okay, so I have some concerns about painting that dark on the right hand side. So let's just start with this side. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry this again, 
because if I, as much as I know I'm not done, but if I start continuing in here, I might wipe off some of that paint and then it's just, so you have to just sometimes be patient when you do this and just like, ah, okay, well, let's just blow dry it and let's keep on going. Okay. Um. Yeah, let's paint this kind of a finish layer. Gonna come back over onto this side with just much thicker paint, and this should block out most of the brown. All these little dried chunks of paint from the inside of that big jar. Super disappointing. Let's blow dry this and just see how we feel.
super frustrating that that's just a, such a little bit of texture. Okay. Okay, um, maybe I, not quite as subtle maybe as I wanted it to be. It's also hard to tell whether, I mean, the more I look at this, this looks maybe like a little bit of a reflection from the way it was photographed from the lights. It does though look a little bit lighter on this right hand side and mine is a little bit lighter on the right hand side and, and I think this is also a bit of a reflection from my lights as well, right? So, um, Worse comes to worse, though, if I'm really not happy with it, then I can always actually take some actual black, mix it into the paint I was just using, and just do the same sort of thing, almost like a little bit of a glaze, just darken in a part of the painting. I think there's a nice slight amount of subtlety here that is okay. Right? Again, I think it's maybe even more obvious on camera than it is here. Here, it's... It's so subtle that what worries me about it is it, it can almost look like a mistake. And I always think like it's better to make it look obvious than for it to be so subtle that people are like, did he just forget to put paint there or was, did he do that deliberately? Right, so that's when I think about like if a, if a horizon is a little bit crooked, it drives me crazy versus if it's like, really then you're like well obviously that was done deliberately because no fool would have the horizon line so whacked out right um okay let's move on here Okay, so now we've got um, our background established. We might still want to do a little bit more to, for, to it and for it. So it might be a good idea just to kind of keep some of that, that paint kind of on the side available for, um, for us to use for the, um, in case we need to, to do a little bit of touch up. So I'm actually just gonna take that paint, scoop it into a little pile here. Before I wash my brush. Pascal asks, can I make a different black with the other half of the split primary? Um, you can. You can. You can. Um, okay. Now, let's... 
let's oh yeah so let's let's go back here so let's uh let's now focus on the shoes that the that central aspect of this painting here so when it comes to the shoes let's take a look at the painting and let's just think about like what color of pink we want to use here because it's worth just sort of taking a second and maybe a little bit of an experiment with those colors so that we can make a, an informed decision as to what um, what red that actually is because we've got two reds on our palette here so there's no harm in doing a little bit of a test now my I'll tell you off the top my assumption is that it's going to be a warm red not just because it's in the foreground but it just has a little bit more of um, of like a, a warmer peachier color but having said that, if you want like a, when people I think think of pink, they probably think of the magenta and white, which is their cool, cool red. So let's just, um, rather than me just assuming that I know, let's just mix the paints and, and just uh, see for ourselves. So let's take, um, let's take some white, put some, a little bit of white here, and put a little bit of white here. And let's start with our cool, um, cool red. So you can see we got a really nice hot pink going on there. Now I think there is a little bit of um, uh, there's some yellow in it. So let's just take some of our cool yellow and put that in there and just see what that looks like. Not too bad, that's pretty close. Pretty close. So I could be proved wrong here. Let's just take uh, the other red, our warm red. And let's do the same sort of thing. Let's take some warm yellow and mix that Might have put a bit too much yellow in there. Let's put a bit more red back in. Hmm. Well, you know, it looks like there might be almost a little bit of both in here. That if we took a little bit of our cool red and mixed it in here, then I think we're going to be probably in the zone. There is my, my, uh, let's put some of this more cool yellow in here. I think that's pretty close. Okay. Um, 
I'll start out a little bit more zoomed out. And then we'll I'll kind of get that initial layer in. So really what I've got here, just as a quick wrap up, is I've got basically a bit of both. I've got my warm red and my cool red. Uh, that gives it that little bit more of a pinkish quality. Uh, if I have just my warm right in there, it's going to be a little bit more peachy. And there is a peachy quality to it, but it's also a little bit more on the pink side. So the magenta kind of keeps it from getting too orangey, peachy, and keeps and gives it a bit more of that hot pink kind of quality. So, um, yeah. Oh, and then I use, actually used cool yellow. And the reason I used cool yellow instead of the warm yellow is it's just there's already some warm yellow here obviously um but uh also to kind of keep it from getting too orangey because the orange the cool the warm yellow has got a more of an orange quality to it okay now there is white in this paint so i feel fairly confident that i can kind of paint over my darker background. Although we'll see. And there's a little ridge here, and I don't want that ridge, so I'm just going to take my fingers and wipe all that extra paint off. So obviously as I've done this, the, my, some of my pencil lines are kind of hard to see. That's okay. I mean, it, maybe if I hold my hands, you might be able to see. Oops. Ah. My paintbrushes are shedding. do just want to see I want to see how low that went because I, I did yeah okay, that's pretty good oh 
Okay. Now, obviously, well, I don't know if it's that obvious. <laughs> I was going to say obviously, but um, there are parts where... Um, let's see if I zoom in here. It might be easier to see now. Where the... Um, it's still a little bit dark underneath there. And maybe you even can see here as well. That's okay. First of all, it's, we're going to darken those areas anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, another layer of paint with a bit more white in there, and that would cover that completely. So I'm not super worried about that kind of thing. If I had, let's say, done a... There was a lot of that. I really was, you know, pretty wild with my application of the black paint. What I could do is paint white literally over top then put a little bit of the warm yellow in prematura or just warm yellow back over those areas to clean that up Just like how there's this little bit of a, a lip that comes up. And I'm just painting over some of those areas where it was a little bit um, too dark. Or the darkness was coming through the pink. And the white inside this pink does a lovely job of covering that up. the what do you call that the inside of the shoe is that's not the insole I don't know what what do we call that it's kind of a little bit of a brown it's it's like the pink but it just got maybe a bit more it has more yellow in there for sure I'm gonna take a bit of my warm yellow this time close let's see a bit more yellow but I'm also going to take just a little dab of my warm blue which is just going to turn make it a little bit more gray or brown depending on how you want to think about it just neutralizing some of the intensity of that color I'll maybe take a little bit more yellow I always like a little bit more color. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's take this paintbrush.
maybe it wasn't the smartest idea to use that pink brush. It kind of got took away some of the intensity of that color. I do see a little bit of that same kind, almost like a bit of a highlight of it here. I'm going to take this same color while I've got it. So I'm just using that same color and applying it elsewhere. It's not, I'm gonna go back over it with some pink as well. It starts to get a little bit of that highlight going on there. Okay, let's, what should we do next? I think I'm going to do, I'm going to do that again and start getting the darker colors again. So let's. I'm gonna take my but more of my warm yellow, my warm red, and my white. So blue, let's take a bit more yellow then. Now it's a little bit too far the other side. Let's get a bit more red. Closer the first time. Let's take a bit more blue. Well, I don't mind it a little intense. You know, I kind of like my bright colors. That looks very yellowy on camera. This looks much more like a green in person. I'm 
Interesting. Oh well. Now I'm gonna take a little bit of my black. Maybe go to an even smaller brush. Trackpad? Did the battery die on my trackpad? Battery off. Okay, there we Debra and Pascal says it needs more yellow. What? I'm not sure what you're talking about. I don't know. I mean, it might look like that on camera, perhaps, but uh, I think if I put any more yellow in there, it's going to change quite radically. Again, it looks a little bit different in person than it does on camera, so I always, I'm a little reluctant to try to go too far with trying to match those colors. So here I'm just sort of almost like dry brushing this this in.
I'm gonna take my, I need to mix a bit more of my red, or my pink anyway. make a version of this it's like a um, dark version of my pink hmm no that's not what I was wanted to do at all needs to be darker. Okay, you can see this is almost like he's using actually just black just to darken in some of those areas. Uh, oh, maybe while it's here, let's take the same dark color. And 
I'm just sort of like dry brushing this pink in here. Barely any paint on my brush. It's the dry brush, right? It's interesting that that still on camera looks so yellow and yet on in person this looks almost identical to the image that I see on the left so um, it's one of those weird things okay so what I'm gonna do now I'm gonna take my glazing fluid and I'm gonna do a little bit of glazing with my dark my black here all these caps and stuff off. Actually, before I do that, I want to blow dry this. Nikki has to go. And Lolly says, uh, looks great. I'm think I really am really liking this painting. I wasn't crazy about it at all to start, but with every detail, I'm liking it more and more. Cool. That's what I find about most paintings. More and more I look at it, more I'm like, whoa, wow. That's that's better than I initially looked. I, I think most art is like that. The more and more one looks, the more and more we, we start to see things that maybe weren't apparent originally. Okay, so I'm using my satin glazing fluid, and this is gonna make the, the paint a little bit more transparent. And I'm just gonna use my black here. And this is gonna allow me to kind of just darken, almost kind of like dirty the painting up a little bit. And I can also go as kind of, do as much or as little as I need. That also helps kind of cut down that yellow a bit. Also do that in the reflection as well.
So I'm gonna blow dry that and then we'll keep on. Oops, I gotta fix these, this, uh, one second. getting there. Okay, I'm going to blow dry all that again and maybe do another little bit more darker. Thank you. 
Now I think I want it to do just a little bit more... Um, I'll do a little bit of some highlights with a little bit of brighter... Uh, with, with some white, actually. So let's do the opposite here. In fact, let's just clean that brush. So we'll take some white now. And I'm gonna take my uh, glazing fluid. Does make it look kind of very pinkish. That's okay, but It's a little bit of a ghost reflection there. Uh, let's go back to the black. In fact, I think I'm just going to take some. Oops, that's a lot of black.
Let me get a little bit more of that arch. So it's just this matter of just darkening and lightening and darkening and light. So I'm also just taking a bit of my black, just kind of dabbing it into the glazing fluid just to lighten it up a little bit. And then by what I can do then is just bring this into the right up against this shape here and just give it more definition. It's also good, we would expect it to be darker right next to that uh, bow or whatever it is. Um, because that's where the light's going to sort of, there's going to be the least amount of light where those two things touch, right? So I'm being pretty careful in this little area right there about getting it too dark. Um, because otherwise it's going to make that slipper look like it's, it became really thin. And what we want is just, it's actually a shadow and not the, the, the edge of that shoe. So just want to leave with just that little hint of red pink underneath there.
Interesting. What is this thing here? Is this a big weird scuff or ketchup or what did she step into or you know like is that a part of the shoe? Such a bizarre kind of thing there, isn't it? So I'm just trying to get the shape of that shoe in. Taking my black with a little bit of glazing fluid and just going up over the edge of that shoe back side here. Just because the edge that I had was pretty sharp. And I like how she kind of blended it out. It kind of it's pretty subtle. Maybe even a little bit of this side too. I'm going to blow dry this.
Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, just a couple small things I want to do to wrap up. Um, and really, what is it? I think I just want to bring back a little bit of that pink in a few places, like in the bows here, or whatever they are. Like right now, these sort of look like lumps. So I just want to try to give a little bit more texture to it. Now, she did a masterful job of doing this. Um, and that's the hallmark of an impressionist painter is, you know, the just a couple quick brush strokes that make us believe that something is something entirely different, right? So, why is that? Uh... Let's dive down in. see what she did here. I'm not sure I'm gonna spend all the time. Like, she's got this sort of... It almost now looks like a feather or something kind of coming up over top. So let's take our cool red, our warm red, and cool yellow, and white. Oops. Just darken a bit of that.
Actually, let's blow dry that. Let's take our black again. Glazing fluid. Got a little bit of red in this black. I mean, I didn't wash my brush. Okay, I think I could continue doing this forever, but maybe just want to take a little bit more black. Okay. I think I can move on here. <clears throat> okay. So, now let's take a quick side-by-side -side comparison, see how they turned out. 
and um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Maybe just before we do so, just remember to like this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell so you know when upcoming videos are taking place. We're doing a special one on Sunday. We're going to be looking at Nikolai Gogol, uh, the great Ukrainian author whose portrait was painted by a Russian artist. And I think... Um, it gives a good a good opportunity to sort of talk about Ukrainian history, Russian history, and the you know where they differed. And um, while we while we talk about one of the great authors of all time, one of my favorite authors. Um, and then next week we are looking at Henrietta Shore next Tuesday, another fantastic artist who just so happens to be a woman. It is um, Women's History Month, so. I want to continue, I mean, we've been looking at women outside of Women's History Month, but I try to want to do a little bit more of a spotlight on that, of course, during this uh, next uh, few weeks. Okay, thank you so much. Oh, let's uh, do, if you want a donation, here's a couple ways you could do that. You could use the PayPal, you can use the Super Chat function. Not the, they don't, I only get like 60% of your donation, so better to use PayPal or send an e-transfer is the best um, through email, my emails on my website, or contact me through the Facebook group. If you haven't joined the Facebook group, do that right now. Once again, here's our Facebook group. Um, awesome group of people in here grows day by day by day anyway let's look at these paintings side by side um uh, you know again i mean she, she hers is i think is masterful um hers just that little bit more subtlety probably just a little bit more familiarity with women's shoes than i have <laughs> Um, there's something about how, she, like, there's something about the way I painted mine that the shoe just looks a little stubbier than hers. Um, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Like, I think on camera, I got pretty close to the inside of this here, but it does look a little duller inside. I wish I, instead of darkening and darkening to try to make it look good on camera, I just kept it looking good in person but that's you know there's that's always a bit of the juggle doing these live streams um maybe i could have refined this shadow a little bit more or reflection i mean not so bad i could have also that's also so subtle but it looks so much brighter in person it does you wonder what this table is it's it's got to be a piece of glass or something a glass uh, table to create this gap otherwise that reflection would be touching the heel itself unless there's some sort of like piece of rubber or something maybe that's what it is but you don't I can't really see that in the original something that's it, it does make it a bit of an odd picture um, you can see it's a little bit lighter on this side, which is what I try to do. Keep a little bit of that uh, inputting matura and the brown coming through. I think it's super, super subtle. It's probably one of those things where under certain light, it's going to be way more obvious than other times. Uh, let's just zoom in and just take a quick look. Um... Okay, let's start on the left here. Yeah, you know, one thing I, I instead of just putting white in here, I probably could, should have put a little bit of cool yellow and maybe a touch of, of uh, even warm red or a bit of warm red and cool red. So it's not just pure white here. Um, it does look a little, because it just makes it a little bit drowned out, that uh, tint there. Not bad, not bad, but, you know. Um, same sort of thing, like, just the, the subtle, like, I 
you know, made these little lips on the back of the 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 shoe here. Uh, I guess I was just a little bit afraid of doing what she did here and just going right off into the edge. I mean, I think she was, was one of the great painters of all time, and she can pull that off. <laughs> it's a little, a little tricky. There's a great deal of subtlety in this little tiny painting. I mean, this painting is just about an inch bigger than than my own painting, and it all it just seems like it was done on a gigantic canvas, the way how much detail she was able to cram in here. Like I feel like I could have continued to darken that down even more. But uh Hers is also just way more subtle. But as I keep on saying over and over and over, um, mine also in person is uh, much more subtle than it might appear on camera. Okay, and let's just zoom back out one last time. It is surprising how a little pair of shoes can can be uh, can have, occupy so much attention, right? I, I I would also encourage you to think about maybe if you don't want to paint uh, Ava Gonzalez's shoes, maybe you could try painting your own shoes. I'm sure we all have a nice, really nice pair of shoes somewhere in the closet that we only wear to like weddings or something, right? That haven't been worn in a long time. Maybe it's time to break them out and make a painting of it. I think it would be really interesting to see how that turned out. And then maybe once you've got a good painting of it, maybe you feel like, well, maybe I could sell these or get rid of them, donate them. Because I have, maybe they don't fit anymore, right? So, um, and often that's a great way of just, of capturing a memory and then the original you not don't have to hold on to it quite so dearly. Okay, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll see you guys on Sunday for special painting at uh, four, I think, on Sunday. Otherwise, uh, until then, enjoy the your your morning, evening, noon, wherever you happen to be on our beautiful planet. Thank you. We'll see you guys again very soon. And good night, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>